I have nine third lines in my chart. So every, every activation in your chart um, is not only a gate, mm -hmm. right? but every gate also has a line. And for those who, who haven't studied the, um, how, how it works, essentially, like if you're coming from an astrology background, you know that we divide the ecliptic into 12 signs. Mm -hmm. Well, in human design, we divide the ecliptic into 64 hexagrams. So we have 64 equidistant divisions of the year of the hexagrams. And that's actually something that's a good way to learn human design. If you have an astrology background, you could look at the hexagrams of Capricorn, for instance, which includes 54, the gate of ambition. Well, we know Capricorns are ambitious. Mm -hmm. It includes uh, 38, the fighter, which struggles for purpose. Well, we know that Capricorns will fight long, arduous battles for what they believe in. 60, gate of limitation, and so on. You can kind of start to see, you know, Capricorns know how to handle limitation. Gate 10, which is all about being well behaved. And, you know, and, 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 and actually, it's very multivalent. It has many meanings, but one of the things that Capricorns are known for is their, more, their behavioral code, we could say. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they're very, you know, if, yeah, if you have kids who have a gate 10, Again, they're the most well behaved children. And then a kid that doesn't. In public. Have <laughs> sure. Unless they have a third he's line. Also, he's also Gemini uh, rising. And so. I have to say, unless they're gate 10, line 3, because, it's a, it does because get... well, the division is also about, um, and here I can turn this a little bit to get, so, well, yeah, because you're still off, you're off screen. So if we're going to, I like people oh, okay. to be on screen, let me just, let's see if we can get, there we go. That's even better. Yeah. So, um, Gate 10 is all about behavior, but then I was, I was saying you can get even more precise because each gate is divided into six lines, the, the lines of the hexagrams. A gate is a hexagram. And so, and they're also equi equidistant. So of the 64, it's almost like, have you ever looked at um, Sabian symbols? You know, Sabian symbols? In astrology, there's a, kind of an imagistic line, almost like a poem for every single degree. That's kind of what the lines are like. Every, I mean, the lines, there are 384 lines, 64 times six. The Sabian symbols there are 360. So, I mean, they're not an exact correlation, but it's kind of like that. Or it's kind of like decanus, if you look at the, the deacons and or the decans in astrology. So, because each gate has six subdivisions, when we get into a gate like gate 10, you know, your son doesn't only have gate 10 activated, he has 10 line one. 10 line 2, or 10 line 3, or 10 line 4, or 10 line 5, 10 line 6. Now, to go into the lines is really a topic that um, we should just do a whole day for that, mm -hmm. because it's, it's really a fun topic to explore, and that's where we get profile from. But the short of it is each line has its own quality, and the third line is the quality of making mistakes. And the quality of experimenting and trial and error and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And so my joke was, if he has line three of gate 10, he'll be seeing what he can get away with in terms of behavior, you know? And I have nine activations of my 26 activations in my human design chart that are all in third lines. So I have kind of a lot of third lines. Oh, interesting. And so, yeah, it's a lot more than normal. I also have a lot of first lines. I have only one second line. Only one fourth line. So huh. you, you see charts where people have an overabundance of certain lines. Um, also, something about gate 10, Ivy has gate 10 line 5, which gives her kind of a secondary profile almost. If you study profile, this is just how the world sees you, and this is kind of how you're expected to be in the world, what role you play, so to speak. And her profile is the 2 4. Mm -hmm. But because she has gate 10, line 5, she also kind of takes on many of the roles of the fifth line as well. Oh, interesting. So, do you know your profile? Have you gotten that one? Yeah, 5-1 ego. Oh, that's right, right, 5-1. Yeah, because I looked at your chart like yeah. a couple years ago. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. yeah, I remember 5-1. So I'm a 5-1 as well. Ah. Rob was a 5-1, who mm -hmm. was the messenger of the system. And so even though Ivy's a 2-4, she has something in common with our fifth line because she has that extra fifth line. And your son, regardless of his profile, he will also take on qualities because he has gate 10. He has a line activated there. 10 is a very important um, gate. It's the gate that is active during the winter solstice. And uh, 
But Mike has some good comments in Gate 10. I don't know if that would be too much of a di divergence, but I can just say uh, he pointed out because Gate 10 is the gate of self-love, which is kind of interesting. Like, what does self-love have to do with being well-behaved? Well, it's a form of self-love to behave well so that you... Like, in China, it's called treading on the tail of a tiger, and it really signifies knowing how to not step on the tail of tigers. If you really love yourself, you don't step on the tail of a tiger because then it will eat you. <laughs> and so people who have gate 10 Especially can, 10 yeah, yeah, so, so Mike pointed out that on the darkest day of the year, um, the sun is in gate 10, which is the gate of self-love, so self-love kind of requires the darkest in the external maya so that you can see the inner mm -hmm. glow of the light of self-love, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can really experience that in this kind of lonely, darkest day. And so on. It contrasts with Gate 15, which is the summer solstice and is the love of humanity, mm -hmm. the love of everybody. Right, gate, gate 15, 15, and then Gate 15 is also called the Gate of Extremes. And if you've ever seen Humans of New York or something like that, you'll know that humanity has such an expression of extremes, mm -hmm. how extremely mm -hmm. different people are. Mm -hmm. So people born in the summer solstice are really here to embody. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing is if you're born on the summer or the winter solstice, you have both 15 and 10 because they're exactly opposite times. And in human design, activation occurs not only from the sun, but also the earth, which is always 180 degrees opposite of the sun. So if you look at an astrology chart, you can see your sun sign, like I'm a sun in Libra, but you don't see that I have earth in Aries because I guess they would think it's superfluous to kind of... All, we, you know, all Libras have, have Earth and Aries, right? All Aries have Earth and Libra. So it's kind of superfluous in an astrology chart. It's not oh, giving right. you any new information. Mm -hmm. But in human design, it is giving you new information because you get to see that the exact opposite gate is activated. So that's kind of cool. Like, if you are born into the gate of extremes, yes, your sun sign, you're kind of an exemplar of this love of extremes. Our good friend Von Paul is a... Um, 815 personality son, line two, and he um, he goes to all sorts of extremes. It's people who are on the gate of extremes, they get obsessed temporarily with things, and they just go to such extremes where they just get on a, they get hooked on something, you know. And if it's the sun, it's a big part of their personality. Now, regardless though, if somebody's born on the winter or the summer solstice, they're going to have both gates 15 and 10 because those are opposite on the wheel. They're what are called polarities. Aside there. So in any case, yeah, when you're looking at the lines, um, it's, you know, there's a commonality between all the lines, and um, we, we can kind of get back to the, 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 the topic here, but I would just say, when I first came to human design, I thought, wow, how will I learn all this? There's 64 different hexagrams, and each one has six lines. That's so much. It's like six variations of the hexagram. But then I started to look at it the other way around. There's six lines. And the continuity is at the line level. So if you learn the six lines, you start to see that each one of those has 64 variations. 64 ways of expressing a first line, you know, one for each gate. 64 ways of expressing a second line. So you start to see the commonality of the line. It's a much, it's a much easier thing to understand what is a first line about. Well, it's about foundations. It's about getting to the bottom of things. What is a second line about? And so on. And uh, we have a couple of videos we've done on it. Or if people want to, we can always... I mean. This is a very democratic process where if folks want to hear the lines next week, we'll just do the lines next week. We meet every Monday, so we pretty much can just do what people want due to popular demand. Um, so we can always do a whole day on the lines. But today, I'm excited to do Manifestors, and we've been doing a whole introductory series on the types because we have some newcomers and we kind of wanted to um, just take a step back from some of the more advanced topics. We were getting into some pretty deep areas of substructure, what is called substructure, which is even more precise than the line, and can get into areas like cognition and, and things like that. And um, we just had some newcomers, so we thought, let's do foundations. Let's do, let's do type. So before we talk about manifestors, I'll just give a little context of what is type. And type basically um, is about the aura. And it really, the type always comes down to the aura. So when we're talking, I mean, you can almost say the type is aura type. It's your type of aura. What, what is your type is also the kind of aura you have. 
And aura is ultimately this invisible but still physical kind of part of the body. It's not like you have an aura. You are the aura in addition to being the body. Like, it is you. It really is you. And it extends more or less about an, arm, an outstretched arm length from the, your outstretched arm. So, you know, I'm not really in Olivia's aura too much. Some people, you know, through aura exercises or different things, I mean, I have a friend who saw Ravi Shankar live, and my friend was in an altered state of consciousness at the time, uh, thanks to psilocybin. And he was able to see Ravi Shankar's aura filling up the room. So I don't want it to be like your aura is limited to only being, you know, six feet from your body, but generally speaking, the aura is not in this expanded state. It's kind of just this, this energetic uh, field that surrounds your body like an egg. And some people see auras, and some people have synesthetic experiences of them, but um, when we study the aura, we're not really talking about the color of the aura, like in curly and photography. We're, we're talking more about what kind of aura you have. Because not all humans have the same kind of aura. And this is one of the interesting discoveries of human design, that there are these types. And the types uh, are the manifester, that's what we're going to talk about today, the projector, the generator, arguably the manifesting generator, although there's debate of whether it's the same as a generator aura. Or, I mean, it's, it's obviously different in some ways. It's more just like how different does it need to be to really qualify as its own type. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into that debate because to me it doesn't really matter. It's Obviously they're different. I mean, manifesting generators are not generators, but they are also very, very similar to generators in some key ways, and their auras are very similar to generators. And then finally, the reflector. So we, there's basically four types. Some people say there's five types. It's kind of a matter of opinion. It's kind of like saying, like, you know, what is an elephant like? It's like, okay, you can describe the elephant, but really an elephant is like an elephant. I mean, if you see one, you know it's an elephant. So. I don't really get into these hair splitting uh, conversations, but, but basically just to go over the, the, the auras, the reflector has a sampling aura. So they're here to essentially sample and to kind of take in temporarily and see and, and test other people's auras. We say that they have a Teflon aura. The projector has a penetrating aura. And in a recent video we did, we did on projectors, we explored what that's like, where they're basically here to lock into someone else's G center, which is their center of identity, love, and direction, and to really deeply um, recognize and kind of see that other the other person, or just things as well. Um, but they're here to have this penetrating, locking in, sort of focused aura. The generator and the manifesting generator have absorptive auras. They have very um, magnetic auras that are drawing everything to them. And so they're, they're really pulling everything in. They're kind of attracting it and sponging it and kind of... They're, it's, it's a porous aura, so it, things go in and out. Like if a generator is thinking about something, you kind of know what they're thinking about. If they're feeling something, they're kind of wearing their emotions on their sleeve. People can kind of tell what the generator is feeling and what, what they're, what they're you know, experiencing. And then you have the manifester, and the manifester has a repelling aura. And that's an aura that pushes people away. Now, it doesn't mean that someone who connects closely to the manifester is going to be repelled. They're going to have gotten comfortable enough or close enough with the manifester that they can have... I mean, manifestors can have multi-hour conversations and deep connections and all of this. I think what it means, though, is that if you don't know that person that well, and if you're not plugged into them and you're not connected in that way, um, or if you haven't spent that time together, I've seen manifestors go to a party and sit down and people just start to leave. I've seen, you know, Ra would joke, it's funny when you have a really attractive manifestor at a party because you have people coming up to them all night long, kind of flirting with them and trying to stay in their aura. And he likes to watch how long they can make it before they're like, okay, okay see ya. Yeah, yeah, good chat. Okay, Bye. see you later. And then they go, exactly, right? There's only a certain amount of time that they can really make it, you know? They can, uh, they can try the best that, that they can, um, but at a certain time, they're going to be pushed away. And there's a reason for this, because of what the manifestor's role is. Um, if we imagine a kind of perfect world 
the manifester initiates, the projector guides and orchestrates to man basically manages to through to completion. The generators and manifesting generators do all the work. And the reflector tells you how it's going. And they're your measurement to kind of sample and check in with different people and tell you the health of the team and the health of the committee and the health of the community and the health of all of these different things because they're here to sample. And it's interesting that manifestors, you know, it fluctuates what percentage. Um, I've heard people argue over what percentage it really is. There's no need to argue. There's actually a book by Adrian Kogler called Rave Statistics because the rave is kind of a term used in human design to signify the nine-centered being and also more specifically a new consciousness that's emerging. And it typically also just means kind of human design, human design statistics, like rave psychology, rave statistics. It's used a lot in human design to describe um, some of the areas of research. And so in the book Rave Statistics by Adrian Kobler, he actually generated hypothetical births every 10 seconds from the late 1700s to the early 2000s, basically, till 2027, from 1781 to 2027. And the reason he did this was so he could see how the percentage changes over time. In some years, there's only 7% manifestors. Some years, there's 14%. Some years, you only have generators the whole year because Pluto or Neptune or some combination of outer planets are activating the sacral system and you only have generators and manifesting generators for the entire year. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it fluctuates a lot and it's really interesting to see how the program, so to speak, needs different so, types and different quantities right? at different times. Like they're, yeah, like really we need a lot of manifestors now, get them all in there, you know, and like a bunch of manifestors are born and then, okay, we're good. Let the manifestors not, you know, they've done their work and huh. let we need more projectors and so on. But generally speaking, we usually say 1% reflectors, 9% manifestors, 20% projectors, and then 70% generators and manifesting generators, pretty equally split. So 70% of the world is a generator or a manifesting generator. That already tells you it's a generator's world. And seven out of 10 people you meet have a defined sacral system you're basically in a world of people who are not here to initiate. They're here to work. They're here to kind of be directed and be guided and be orchestrated and be, um, you know, they, they don't necessarily know, you know, where to go or, or what to do. And conventionally, it's been the manifestors who have enlisted the generators and manifesting generators. Since 1781, We've undergone this, this change. We're actually in what's called the Plutonic Interregnum, which is this time of great change since the end of the 1700s. And it's basically the time where the seven-centered being is dying out. The seven-centered being that you'd be familiar with from studying yoga, from studying the seven primary chakras, uh, we are now nine-centered. And that is what the human design body graph is. And interestingly, um, you can see there's all these memes online about are people aging slower now? They're like, this is my dad. He's 22 years old. And he like, looks like he's 50, you know? And there's all these, like on Twitter, there's these threads where people can see all the memes of like, this was my high school teacher. He's 24. And it's like a bald guy with glasses who looks like he's like 50, 60. Now we have people 50s and 60s who are so youthful and so young in appearance and even just in spirit and everything else mm -hmm. because what part of that transition was was the move from the Saturnian being that had a 28-year lifespan or essentially reached old age at 28 to a Uranian being that reaches old, reaches old age at 84. And so it's quite a difference and, and scientists have tried to say, oh, it's because of quality of life improvements and it's because of modern medicine but that's a little bit, you know, it's an interesting thought experiment. What would happen if we suddenly evolved into a new form as different as the Neanderthal is from Homo sapiens sapiens, right? Now, the Homo sapiens sapiens was the seven-centered being. Now we've evolved to what um, Ra calls Homo sapiens transitus, which is a transitory nine-centered form here to kind of make way for the true nine centered form that was given the name of the rave. And that's, we have a lot of interesting um, 
kind of forerunners to that, uh, the rise of autism and the rise of mm -hmm. Down syndrome and, and so on are kind of indications of uh, mutative consciousness that has not yet fully found its footing in the, in the, in the human, uh, you know, yeah, and it's like, it's, they're almost like too soon. They're like a little bit too early of this new consciousness. We're still so steeped in an older, hyper-competitive consciousness, the killer monkey, the seven-centered being that is really here to compete for limited resources that the new consciousness emerging um, hasn't, hasn't quite found its footing because it's just so new and it hasn't really reached, uh, you know, critical mass yet. But anyway, part of that big change has been that the manifester has changed its position where it was always at the top of the hierarchy. And some people come to human design and have problems with hierarchies, and it's not that we can't cooperate or have flat ontologies where we, we're all valid and so on. In fact, that is the new consciousness that's coming. It's a sort of a non-competitive, receptive consciousness. But the fact of the matter is, there are still hierarchies, and the hierarchies have to do with division of labor, and it's just the efficiency of life, that life itself creates hierarchies. And it's inefficient to take the rare manifester and put them in the role of the generator working for someone and take the common generator and say, no, no, no. It's inefficient. It's cruel. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a cruel and unusual punishment to make the manifester work for generators. It really is. It really is. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so, you know, it's, there are these hierarchies and there's no value judgment. There's no morality there. It's simply how things are designed. You know, there's a driver and there's a passenger. We all know how backseat drivers are, you know. So, so the manifester has always been at the top of the hierarchy since time immemorial, since the seven-centered being emerged out of the five-centered being. And they really are responsible for the initiation of pretty much every major um, development in human history. I mean, we've had manifestors who were the Egyptian pharaohs and manifestors who were the business leaders and manifestors who were essentially at the, the head or the top of just about every, um, every organization throughout most of history. And then in 1781, when we entered into this Plutonic Interregnum, this, this time frame that was um, kicked off with the discovery of Uranus and then had the discovery of Neptune and discovery of Pluto in the 1800s, 1900s, it's sort of a progressive deepening of uh, the human psyche and of interiority and the development of what we call right variable cognition, which is kind of like right brain, receptive, holistic cognition, non-competitive, all of this. It's a very different paradigm. I mean, this is a recent paradigm that really only emerged in the last few hundred years. And so the manifestor role has, the manifestors are kind of like the, the great stallions put out to pasture. I mean, it's not that they don't have a role. Ra was a manifestor and he brought us human design. And there are manifestors who make such an impact on the world, a tremendous impact. It's more that in terms of being the, the heads of the various hierarchies, the projector has replaced the manifestor. And the projector is a new type that didn't exist before the late 1700s. So when Ra was kind of given this information and it, and it was all laid out to him, and he knew at that point that he was a manifester and how the dynamics of the manifester work, because the manifester really is here to initiate. You know, they're here to start new things, and they're, they're here to have an impact on the world and do something for the world that's never been done. They're here to bring about change, to facilitate really tremendous change in the world, to do something completely new, and they're not, you know, in, in, in all of this, and he basically understood, and the projector is here to replace the manifesto. Well, how does the projector work? They're invited, mm -hmm. and they're not here to initiate, and they have to be recognized and invited. And he thought, these spineless, groveling twerps have to be invited. <laughs> you know, he's a powerful manifester. He's an ego manifester as well. He's like, I would just go out and say, you, pick up that rock, start building that pyramid. You know, you, come here and do this. You know what I mean? The manifester is the boss. Yeah. And he's like, really? That's the replacement the program came up with? They replaced this, like, powerful stallion that could just, like, build the world we live in? Through, through directing people and telling them what to do, and they've replaced them with the projector who has to be invited. 
they, they're kind of, you know, they have to be, they can't walk through the threshold of the door unless you invite them in. Kind of like, it's interesting that the myth of the vampire became popular around the same time as the projector type emerged. And also that projectors are non-energy types. Projectors and reflectors are not energy types. And manifestors are energy types because they de facto have a motor connected to the throat. Mm. So the generators, manifesting generators, and manifestors are all considered energy types, even though they have a different relationship to the energy. The manifestor isn't here to work day in, day out on a grind. They're here to essentially work in fits and starts and kind of save up their energy and then use it at the right time uh, to be really effective and have the biggest impact. Unlike the generator who's kind of here to manage and to do the day-to-day -day, uh, maintaining of, of things. But, you know, nevertheless, it was really shocking for Ra when he kind of came to the realization that the projector was here to replace him. He who could, you know, build the world, basically. And it's just a, really a sign of this new paradigm that's mm -hmm. emerged, a paradigm of invitation and, and so on, because the manifester was really the... You know, they were the monarchs of the seventh century world. And they were the ones who were um, the most effective because they could catch people off guard by withholding information and doing something no one had done before and having these ingenious creations that would win the battle or that would, you know, defeat their opponent for the same limited resources and so on. All of these seven centered projects. Obviously, they did a lot of amazing things as well in terms of art and architecture and the creation of society and basically building society as we know it. Um, but it is interesting that we are now in a, a place where essentially the manifester is no longer needed at the tip of the spear or at the top of the hierarchy for the future world that we're now building, which is the nine centered world. It's like it's already been built, now we just have to figure out how we can use it in different ways, and so on. So, manifestors are here to initiate, and their strategy is to inform. And this is the only strategy that's not mechanical, by which I mean a generator has a sacral system that will respond. Do you want to do this? Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Let's do it. Do you want to do it? You know, uh-huh, uh-huh, or uh, uh, uh. Uh, weird. No, I don't want to do that. You know, uh, you know, that's the generator system. Uh, the manifesting generators may not make sounds because their their sacral connects all the way to the throat, but they'll still say no, or they'll still take an action. They'll just get up and walk away, or they'll get up and walk across the room, or they'll lean back, or you know. So the generator has this sort of fundamental mechanism where, if you're working with a generator, a manifesting generator, what you're really doing is getting them in touch with this mechanism that they've ignored. They've ignored it because of conditioning, because they've thought it's not polite to make a grunt, or they've thought, you know, I should should do this or I should do that. Um, so you're really getting them in touch with that. Projectors also have a mechanism that you're getting them in touch with, which is the mechanism of recognition and invitation. And they will be invited and they will be recognized. And, and these things do happen mechanically. Uh, reflectors have their own mechanism of waiting for a lunar cycle. And that's basically they go through a, a whole cycle of planetary influences. Well, manifestors, informing is not mechanical. It's practical. There's nothing in them that says, I need to inform. You know, there's nothing in them that says, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Informing is there for practical purposes because informing reduces resistance mm -hmm. for the manifestor. And, you know, manifestors can can really suffer. They can suffer from an isolation that the other types will never know. And it's because of their aura. The way Ra describes it is, it's like all these projectors saying, well, I haven't been invited. I feel so uninvited. I'm so bitter about it. Well, just imagine it's impossible to really be invited. You can only really be informed. You know, it's impossible to actually be invited if you're a manifester. In the sense that I can say, hey, you should come. Come on now. It'll be fun. But it's it's always really just transmission of information which you can then use as you see fit right it's kind of it's a little bit of a different mechanism and at a mechanical level a manifester can walk into a cafe people turn and it's like why is that person here because people will get put on edge 
And they might not even realize they're getting put on edge. They might just be so in their mind that, oh, this person looks nice, oh, they're smiling, but something about their energy is this manifester could change everything because the manifester has the power to change and change can be really stressful and that change can have a really big impact and it can, it, you know, it kind of, so there is this, there is this fundamental difficulty of being a manifester uh, at the interpersonal. Now it doesn't mean that they're doomed in any way. I've known manifestors who are in wonderful long, long-term relationships with their childhood sweethearts and they're the happiest people you've ever met. It's not about, I mean, Ra himself was married for 25 years. So it's not about creating a story of, oh, the poor manifester, they're so isolated. It's just that there is an isolating effect of having a repelling aura that only a select few can kind of break through. And it may take other techniques to do that. Two generators can sit on a park bench and feel really close to each other. Manifestors might need intense eye contact for hours or something, you know, to get to that place of having broken through. Uh, there's just kind of a wall that has to be broken through for the manifestor. So it's not, but it's not a, a, sen- a doom sentence. It's just pointing out that these are different auras. And manifestors might assume people know how they feel and then be surprised when a family member says, Oh, I I don't know. I mean, I don't, like, they don't know that you love them, even though you tell them you love them. And you're informing them and saying you love them. But they don't know because the energy is so close to the chest, it's not letting it out the same way. Like, you can see a couple generators, like, oh, that one likes that one, and that one's bored from this one, and this one's more interested in this one. And you can just tell all the generators and how they all feel about each other because their cards are just showing to everyone. And so it's just an energetic thing. So, okay, I I have something I'm going to read from the Manifestor Genoa Living. Any comments, questions so far? I do have a question. Do you think that, um, I was listening to the lecture that Ra gave on the Manifestor, and, you know, he was saying a lot of things, you know, the anger and um, loneliness and um, people not wanting to be around a Manifestor. um, and I definitely felt that early in my life. Oh, and the other piece was not knowing the self, that manifestors don't really know the self. But as I've aged and gotten more in touch with and done my work internally, mm-hmm. then it has shifted a lot of those for me. Like, I'm not, I don't walk around angry like I used to be anymore. Mm-hmm. So, that, so it's definitely shifted a lot of perspectives within me. Uh, absolutely. Well, yeah. So the question is, it's not, it's not like a life sentence, you know, it's not like what he's talking about is, is, is we're born a manifestor, we're going to experience all of that no matter what. No, but I think you are going to experience a childhood in an upbringing and a trajectory that includes yes. some of these things. Yes. And it's going to be a challenge where, so as an ego manifestor, you have an undefined solar plexus. The undefined solar plexus never wants as the not-self anyway, as its sort of default mode, never wants to hurt anyone's feelings, never wants to rock the boat. It's like, hey, are you going to come visit your friend in the hospital? Well, of course I will, because I'm a good friend. Hey, you know, the parents, are you helping Jimmy with math homework? Of course, you know. And Ross said he had an undefined solar plexus as well. He was also an ego manifester, a split ego manifester. And he... Um, you know, he said his mom never actually knew him. She thought he was the golden child. She thought he was the best kid who ever lived. And he was out getting the other kids high or whatever, you know. And she never knew because he had lived up until about age 40, never showing anyone else who he truly was ever, even for a second. Because he was so good at faking it, so good at telling them exactly what they wanted to hear, so good at hiding because he didn't want to hurt their feelings or whatever it is. It's like, so that's a great example of if you're a manifester and you have an undefined solar plexus, it's the easiest thing in the world to spend your whole life avoiding painful truths and making nice. Until and covering it doesn't up. work anymore. Until it doesn't work Until anymore. Until it's like selling my soul and it just, I can't do it <laughs> right, anymore. Right, right. But, but it's something that is going to be then, once you go to the other side of it, then you suddenly have this immediate thing where you're dating someone and you say, you know, I really have to tell you I'm not feeling it anymore. Instead of just waiting two months for the, hoping they break up with you <laughs> or whatever it is, right? Because the thing is, when you avoid the confrontation and truth, it's going to lead to the anger. And the more you just, the second you feel any nervousness at all, you just immediately confront, 
that brings you back to peace. Oh my God, what a nice peace. I feel so peaceful now. I'm not hiding. Well, it's the same thing with the undefined spleen. But for the undefined spleen, it's all about um, holding on to what isn't good for you. And when you just finally let go, and I finally got rid of all that stuff, and I quit my job, and I moved, and now I can have peace, you know. So it's kind of, you're absolutely right. It's not a, it's not a sentence for life, not a life sentence to be that way. But it's also, there's no guarantee. Because there are people who are 70 years old and they're manifestors. Yeah. And they have held on to that safe job with their undefined spleen. And they have avoided confrontation and stayed with the partner for 30 years. You know, you see a lot more of that than the other. So I think here in Santa Fe, we're really lucky that most of the people in Santa Fe who are drawn to a place like Santa Fe are drawn partly to the depth of self-work and yeah. healing modalities. And you, of course, have worked in many healing modalities. I know you're a channel and other things. And you can't do channeling work without confronting some of this stuff, right? You can't, you can't be a Jungian psychologist and not confront some of this stuff. So there are many, uh, I guess we could call them nine-centered modalities that are all guiding you to the journey of self-discovery, but it's hard work. Mm-hmm. It is very hard work. And I have an undefined solar plexus. Uh, you know, it's not every day, but there are times when I have to confront something that's very painful that I don't want to confront. And it doesn't really get easier, even though I've right, been doing yeah, it yeah. for so many years. Yeah. But if I don't do it, I'm going to end up in frustration. So, yeah, so I mean, I, I think. When Ra describes the alienation felt by a manifester or what he's describing is more just kind of what it's like being a manifester in the world because mm-hmm. most of the world is not is not so awake. And we're really mm-hmm. lucky here in Santa Fe because we actually have a lot of awake people. Yeah. They don't have to be in human design to be awake. They could be into sound healing or they could be into some other mm-hmm. thing, but they're very they're at least, you know, you can at least communicate and you can at least say, Hey, look, I, uh, I can't come to this because I'm just not feeling like it. They'll understand. It's also been a cultural shift where culturally we have been deconditioning collectively from, but you can look at certain cultures. I mean, we're very lucky here in the, in the West as well. There are certain cultures that are, have such strong tradition that to even say that you don't want to get married to the person you're part of the arranged marriage with, you'll get disowned yeah. from the entire family. And so you can see the pressure on people to avoid the truth, like with the undefined solar plexus. And of course, there are advantages to those cultures as well. I don't mean to make it so one-sided, but um, you know, there's so much cultural conditioning and collectively, I think all of humanity in the last couple hundred years has gone through this radical transformational process to make it so that people can be more in, in you know, their correct, uh, basically we could call it alignment. So people right. are more and more aligned who they are. Because a manifester isn't here to be controlled by somebody, but with an undefined solar plexus, they can let themselves be controlled. They don't want to hurt their feelings. Mm-hmm. You know, they they can give away their power because they don't want, so, um, yeah, someone yeah. to be hurt. Yeah, it's like I'm not going to hurt you. I'll just go along with it, even though I don't really want to. And that leads to the anger. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. I have a question also. Yes, there absolutely. For it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. who does a manifester? Yeah. And so something was brought up, you know, said that it's, there's challenges in, um, in childhood with that kind of horror type. And definitely there's like dyna- challenging dynamics. And one that I would ask about is how, like some perspective on how to handle the, because they're in authority, right? Like that's their natural way of being, is to be authoritative. So as a parent, when you are there to guide and lead them in at least some ways how would you uh do you have any experience with a what a positive dynamic in that would look like or feel like yeah i mean uh, they have to ask until they're adults and then they can inform so ah. so asking is really the child's strategy mm-hmm. and they have to ask for everything even things they might not think that they have to ask for so i think enforcing some sort of asking now it doesn't mean Um, that you're not permissive, but that you can be permissive once it's asked. But if there's no asking, then uh, that can cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Because, and so it really, it is, I mean, there's nothing mechanical about it. It is conditioning and it's basically getting in a good habit. It's a healthy habit. It's a healthy habit for, you know, adult manifestors can inform. They don't really need to ask. They can just say, I'm not doing this. I'm going here. I'm not doing that. I'm going to do this instead, whatever. Mm -hmm. But as children, uh, it's a very important habit to ask. 
mm -hmm. asking permission. Hey, I'm going to do this now. Can I, can I listen to this? Can I watch this? Can I turn this on? Can I turn that off? Can I, instead of just getting in the habit of, I do what I want. Yeah. Because that is the, the instinct of the manifester. Yeah, and what's funny is, Rod joked, you might have heard this in that lecture, he said, the only kids who end up with leashes, yes, leashes. <laughs> yeah, tend to be manifestors. Yeah. And it's, and it's because, because they just go. they'll just do their own thing. Yeah. And it's, it's not that that's a healthy thing either. I, I, hopefully we don't need that anymore, but that would be an example of when there isn't a... So I think the most important thing is just, um, yeah. you know, you can be as permissive as you want once the asking has happened. That's really so the asking allow is them important. to feel their power through that. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and say, can I go here? Yeah. yeah. Can I do that? Like, now? When I get annoyed yes, with yes. her bossiness, I can tell it's like not a, it's not the way to do it. Mm. But yeah, by having that clear. Um, well, and just saying, if you want to do it, you can ask. Mm. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And so you're you're here to really guide when you're invited to guide. And that's the other thing is letting yourself off the hook because so many projectors feel an obligation to guide when they see somebody making mistakes or doing something that they can help with. Mm. And so it's kind of a double, it's like for her, getting in the habit of asking. For you, letting yourself off the hook and not holding yourself to the standard of having to guide when you're, you haven't been invited. Mm -hmm. Because you can basically see someone make the same mistake every day for a week or a month until they ask you how to not make that mistake, you're off the hook. Right. But a lot of projectors feel on the hook and, oh, I failed if I'm not making sure they don't make this mistake. It's like, no, 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 let them make all the mistakes. When yeah. they come to you and say, please, can you tell me how to do this? That's when you can mm -hmm. step in and go, well, I could have told you last week, but you never <laughs> asked, you know? And so just giving yourself a lot of permission yeah, to just... Your child. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't don't feel like, oh, like they are yeah. reflecting, because, I mean, everyone's going to make their own mistakes and they're going to have their own experience and exploring. And I mean, that, that goes for everything. I mean, projectors are not here to volunteer their help to others. They're yeah. here to basically almost have the idea, be asked or be invited or even even just kind of be, you know, asked a few times, really, like like for there to really, really be a need. And, yeah. yeah, pulled. Mm -hmm. Your help is pulled from you. Yeah. And so a big part of it is just not giving yourself a hard time over all the kind of homogenized thing of what a good parent looks like because you know in your heart of hearts you're a good parent because you're, you're an awake parent, and that's the best kind of parent that can be. So you're seeing what's going on, and you're not, you know, you're not jumping in to say, no, 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 do this now, do this, don't do it this way, because that, that's kind of going against the grain for projectors, mm -hmm. and that just builds up a sort of resentment from both sides, because then yeah. you get resentful that I keep telling you the same thing and it never works. It's well, it's like, yeah. it's like wait, and wait to be asked. You're kind of just off the hook. As long as... I mean, human design parenting is like, as long as you're keeping your child physically safe and emotionally safe, your role is to keep them well-fed and have access to education and protected and physically, you're, you've done your job. And then if they're like, you know, making mistakes and can't figure something out, well, they can ask you to help them. And when they do, you will help them. Mm -hmm. When they don't, you're off the hook. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you know, as long as you're just checking the boxes of, physical and emotional safety and things like that, then you're, you've done your job. There's mm -hmm. nothing, you don't have to like make sure that they know not to make that mistake or something like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, Thank you. It, it really yeah. feels like this is about really understanding and living into our type because when we're living our type, then there's not a confusion. Like I'm not showing up as submissive or, oh, you know, yeah, I'll do that for you. If I'm in yeah. my type, Right? Then it's not as confusing for other people. Right, because they're kind of expecting you to, to just mm -hmm. do what you want anyway. And when, when you actually do, it's actually a relief. But if you say, no, 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 I'll, I'll bend to your will or something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, really. And there's no yeah. peace then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's the same. I mean, I was terrified as, as a generator um, with an undefined solar plexus to really tell people, uh, uh but what's interesting is if I actually make the sound uh, uh and it's legitimate and I see I don't I can't plan it ahead I can't plan it in advance I can't be like when they ask me tomorrow if I want to go to this party I'm going to go like I can't I just kind of in the moment have the courage to take that step to just make the sound people accept it whereas if you are trying to break up with someone as a generator and you go uh, you know, it's not you, it's it's me, and this and that. Like, they hate that. I mean, but if they say, do you want to go out with me, and you go, uh-uh, they accept that. And so it's a really interesting. People just accept 
uh huh, uh huh. They don't accept all of the mental rationalizations. <laughs> so, yeah. And for manifestors, they just accept whatever you're informing them of. I mean, if a manifestor says, "I'm not going to do that," I'm like, okay. Like, I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not suddenly second guessing that. I right. just accept the fact they have informed me. What annoys me is if you know there's a lot of ambiguity, and then something happens that I wasn't expecting. Um, I have my classic manifestor story of not informing. Uh, I was with kind of a Burning Man group, and we would have these Burning Man-esque parties in Seattle, and they'd be really fun, wild, kind of surrealist parties, and we would do scavenger hunts. And we got to the very last clue, and so this is like a big buildup over like an hour. I mean, the clues are really fun and silly clues, and the last clue was on the co-host's back. But it's one of those things where it's hiding in plain sight. She had a big piece of paper, and so the clue was her, but people are looking around the room and they're not noticing that she has this big thing that says like, you know, this is the clue or something on her back. Well, right as when you started the very last clue, um, see the manifestor knew that the clue was on her back. So he thought, well, they could find that clue anywhere. And he was a fire dancer and wanted to do his fire performance. And he, he thought efficiency wise, he didn't want us to all finish and then people would like leave because we'd all been doing something for an hour. He wanted to just segue immediately into the fire dancing outside. So he said, attention everybody, get your shoes on and come outside. The clue is outside. Well, this was a problem because she went outside, but it was dark out and the clue wasn't somewhere outside. You know, when they were still looking inside and then people were like, we've been looking in here for 10 minutes. Why are we wasting our time? Like, like the whole thing was messed up. Like, first of all, the clue wasn't outside. It was on her back. Second, it was too dark to even see. Third, people were annoyed. You know, you know what I mean? Like, they were about to find it, maybe like two minutes before they found it. He's like, attention, everybody get their shoes on oh, outside. He didn't tell us he was going to do that. He didn't tell anyone he was going to do that. Nobody ever found the last clue. They didn't end up, the last clue actually had the prize box where everybody would have got things to, you know, completely, uh, you know, impacted the whole situation and didn't even realize it. And afterwards, we informed him and said, hey, that really impacted He goes, Oh, that's too bad. I thought they would have uh, found it. I mean, it was on your back. I thought you would just go outside and they would find it there. It's kind of, you know, there was no informing of his plan to make everybody go outside. So that was an example where if he just informed and said, hey, everybody, you know, I want the segue because I don't want the people at the party to have a chance to kind of drop off. Let's do the last clue outside or something, you know, he could have coordinated. But there was just a really big impact. And, um... I mean, I've also been impacted in very positive ways, so it's not always a negative, but typically the less informing, the more potential for negative impact. Mm -hmm. uh, the classic example is Orson Welles, who is a manifester. And when I first heard about manifestors, I remember I thought, I bet Orson Welles is a manifester, and, and he is. And it's because he became famous when he did War of the Worlds as a radio broadcast. Have you heard about this story at all? And they thought it was real? They thought it was real, yes, and I people jumped off buildings. People died. A number of people died, yeah. So, I mean, this is what happens when there's no informing. He just said, we're getting invaded, aliens are here, and people, like, <laughs> took it seriously, and he didn't say, this is a fictional story. So, I mean, that's the, that's the power. Manifestors have so much power. You know, if a generator had said that, they would have, like, known he was joking or something, you know. But the manifestor, they, they, don't, they don't have a way of, of de detecting that. So, okay. So I'm going to finish, uh, and then we can, any more conversation is totally welcome. But I'm just going to read a short piece by Genoa Bliven, or Bliven. He's um, the founder of Human Design America. He lives here in Santa Fe, actually. Really? And yeah, he's a 3-5 manifester, quad right. And he was a good friend of Ra, a personal friend of his. What was his name? Genoa Bliven. Bliven. Do you know how to say it? No one knows. G E N O A B L I V E N. Genoa. Manifestors naturally do things that are original. Everything else is a hassle. The hassle aspect stems from the fact that energy is a precious commodity for manifestors. They use it up quickly, doing things with great intensity. It is rare for them to be able to receive energy from others. So they need to rest and have a great big break from everything and everyone to be healthy. Manifestors can feel put upon by nearly everything or anything. Interfacing with others is exhausting. Convention is exhausting and exasperating. Repetition is numbing. Everything must be efficient or the energy will run out before it is complete. 
Nearly every interaction steals their fire and their originality. Yikes. I'm painting a dismal picture, but I thought that you might like to know. The only thing that matters to a manifester is that one original thing that will come out of them that is a game changer. It will change the world in some small but totally amazing way. Everything else is just maintaining, maintaining, maintaining. Boring and depressing. If a manifester is helping you, it is because they want to totally rock your world and turn it into something totally else, to completely remake your world. If they do this, you may feel that you are dying. It can be almost unbelievably disorienting. <laughs> Manifestors are strong medicine meant to be taken in small doses. It may be hard to imagine this kind of reality, but your manifestor brothers and sisters live in that place. They only want to strike like lightning and withdraw. When they withdraw, they push off and impact you. They impact by leaving. They are always leaving, even when they are being there for you. Even while talking to you, they are leaving, trying to make their points so they will never have to make it again. <laughs> At the same time, manifestor children are the most tender beings imaginable, gentle beyond thought or breath. They need protection because they are so alone. There is no connection to anyone for them unless this connection is totally without expectation. Mm -hmm. Imagine for a moment what this might be like, to live like this, to be a child and to be so alone. They're totally alone except for you. When you are with them, you feel alone too. Alone on the edge of a planet that has virtually no living being upon it. You, like them, become the exception to the rule. It's a freaky feeling, is it not? Like there's no one else, no one, they are a being who is so ancient, <laughs> yet nothing they are doing has ever been done before. Even if they're doing what you just did, it has never been done before. <laughs> they are remaking the world in every second. It is weird and inspiring, but weird nonetheless. You can feel how powerful life is when you are just observing it as though it is happening to someone else. The manifestor child will stand on the edge of the play and the socializing of the others, they do not need to participate to feel totally involved, overwhelmingly involved. The world and social interactions seem huge and powerful. The manifestor child is alienated. They are alien. They are tender and vulnerable, cannot join in, not in the same way as others. They feel so close and alone at the same time. They just need your simple understanding of these simple facts. They came to Earth to change the world. Hmm. Change is scary. It is stressful. It is stressful for everyone, even manifestors, especially for manifestors. They are hanging on to their humanity with the tiniest little thread. You can just stand next to them and hold it with them. You need to be so very subtle. Never place an expectation on them of any kind, and you will be their friend for life. Such behavior is so rare. Manifestors get hardened through the expectations of others. No one suffers more because of this hardening than manifestors themselves. Manifestors are naturally tender. Let's do what we can to keep them that way. Ironically, it is through doing nothing that they will feel closest to you. They can feel close to you from a vast distance, even when they are standing right next to you. This vast distance is so important to give them, because through it, they will be close. So close you can hardly believe it is possible closer than your own breath, your own thoughts. This is the secret of manifestors. You give them space, lots of it, and they will come close to you and love you forever. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Genoa. Genoa had some good stuff. All right, well, thanks all for coming. Any last comments, thoughts? Uh, any? That was so spot on for us. Uh, <laughs> no no expectations. The past two and a half weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Olivia knows Lots of space and no expectations. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to be. So. Yeah, a question. Really yeah, important. absolutely. So I'm a generator, and I have a couple of really, really close friends who are manifestors. And when I hear this thing about initiation, it's like, I'm such a free spirit. I'm an entrepreneur. I would like to understand that better in relationship to what I'm hearing about generators. Yeah, so every type who's not a manifestor is trying to be a manifester because the, the manifester has the energy flowing through the throat, which is the metamorphic center. 
And so generators, their whole problem is that they're stuck. They're stuck in their job, they're stuck in the current way of things and being, and they're trying so hard to change it. And that's trying to be the manifestor, trying to initiate something new. It's like this long plateau of stuckness. And what human design is trying to get the generators to do is to stop trying to change it and start living it instead of imagining how different it'll be once they start the new thing. So there's like a huge decondition. the vibration of the thing. It's like really yeah, allowing yourself, to, well, so when you follow your sacral authority, you will have the energy to persevere through nearly endless stuckness. It's like it's okay to be stuck when you're following your sacral authority because you're stuck doing the thing you love. But the generators who aren't following that, they're doing, you know, they have an idea like, I'm going to start this thing. I'm going to start this business because that's going to be what I really want. I mean, it's tough. I mean, for me, I, I want to be doing human design all the time. I can't because I'm not in a place where I can do that. But I also can't initiate it because every time I try, it fails. What I have to do as a generator is prepare myself through responding and all of these micro responses. Like, a good example is... My friend Brian, um, he didn't know he wanted to do any video production or editing or anything, but he just responded to it, like, hey, do you want to do the video recording for the Human Design Conference? Sure, you know, and he, he's emotional, so he waited for clarity on it. He did it. Then he heard about a video editing class. He responded to that. He started doing video editing. Well, three different people asked him to do video editing now. It's this completely organic process. But if you ask him what he wants to do, he would tell you his business plan. And it's probably nothing to do with video editing. So business plans are the world of manifestors. And coming up with this idea of I'm going to start this thing. I mean, basically, the, the, tough, the tough truth is that everyone's trying to be a manifestor because the throat is sort of how everything gets out. And all the energy that builds up is trying to reach the throat. It's trying to tend to it. And the only way it can do it is when it naturally, organically happens through being in your aura. So if you have something that you're really prepared for and you're ready to do that business, you will just organically meet people who will ask you, do you want to do that? And probably a manifester will come along and will start something and then say, but you know what I need is someone to run this thing. But we all are trying to be manifestors. And when we do, we end up just cluttering up the world with, I mean, do you know that 90% of published books end up in a landfill unread? That's the generators. 90% of printed <laughs> materials end up in a landfill unread. How many trees is that? That's a real statistic. Manifestors don't publish books that end up in landfills. They publish books that get read because they know the time and the place and they know how to impact and launch it and they know how to announce it. But all the generators are just saying, me too, me too. I want to have my book there too or I want to have my company. I want to have my business. But does that mean that there isn't a creative spark within the generator, or that they only fulfill that through? I would say that the, the generator or? is the fertile life force. I mean, well, there's so much creativity. There's creative manifestor channels. There's creative generator channels. There, there's a whole series of channels that are creative. But I think what it means is like how much difficulty the generator is going to have in launching and really changing their material circumstances because they want to change everything in a flash, but it can only be changed step by step by step. And it's only changed if each step comes out of response. So I've struggled with this too because for years now, I mean, five years ago, I created a um, open source human design programming toolkit. I didn't initiate it. It was something that I needed because I needed to, there was a real need that came up and I had a weekend. And so I just built it. So we're here to build. We're definitely here to build. But I'm not, I can't then, that was five years ago. I can't affect the timing of when that's going to be adopted or used. I can't get people to use it. I can't get anyone, like literally someone has to email me. Like I get emails sometimes and they're like, how do I use this thing? And I'm like, okay, I can help you with that. But it's kind of like, if we build it, they will come. It's very different than for the manifester, where Ra was like, I need to announce human design to the world. For me to announce it to the world, I have to structure it in a way that it can be understood by the world. And he basically did what every generator wants to do, which is get out there and announce their business and then have the change. You know, it's like one day you're doing this and the next day you have a million clients and it's all working and everything's, you know, I mean, it's not even easy for manifestors either. I mean, manifestors don't, it's not, it's not easy for anyone, but I'll just say that the manifestor, the correct way for them to do it is to use their tremendous skill of knowing how to launch things to successfully change things and say, okay, on this day, I'm starting this. 
before I did that, now I do this now, that was my old life, that's gone, this is my new life, it's here. Generator can't really get rid of the old life that way. Like, generators are like, I mean, it sucks, but like, this is like what, like every generator I talk to is like, how do I launch my business? And the answer is you don't. You do not, you cannot launch anything. Like, you can only respond. So, so what you can do though, is you can get really, really good and you can build, you can build it. You can write a book. You can write and create all of the class materials to teach somebody something. But when you start putting up the flyers to get the students and so on, it's not really going to work that well unless you've you've been you know, it's, it's 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 like you can build it. Like okay, here's a good example. I do the High Desert Human Design Conference. I build it. I build the conference every year. It's like Burning Man or something. You know, like I build the schedule. I build the things for people to come. I can't control or even initiate the announcement of it to get people, like if I went about the uh, the other way, the manifester way, I would say, okay, here's what we're doing from this day to this date, here's the money, here's the thing, here's this, here's that, and it would just be done. I work with a manifester who does that. I went to his event, it was amazing. He just said, he just announced, he said, okay, we're doing the event, here's the price, here's where it is, here's the dates, here's who's doing it. It just happened. He didn't have to build it step by step at all. He built it all in one go, mm -hmm. in one whirlwind of fury, and he just built it fully formed and birthed it into the world as a fully formed thing. And it was a huge success and it worked perfectly. And it just, you know, he crushed it. That's not the generator way of doing it. Like we are here like day in, day out. Like every day I'm like, oh, this might be a fun thing to put in the conference. Let me build this and see if anybody wants to use it. Like here's a great example. Like I got a laminator. I, I don't know if anyone's going to want laminated things, but we have that. I have built, I have built the ability to laminate your human design chart. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like at the conference, if people use it last year, we had it too. Nobody used it. So, I mean, you know, but it's there if they want it, that's what we can do. We can build it if they want it. We just can't make them want it. You know what the stations. Stations. Yeah. I love the word incubator. You hear that in tech, you hear that in biology. Generator is double yin. It is the ground that everything grows from. You know what I mean? It is the incubator. Yeah, we can, generate. we can incubate generate. our business. But, pure uh, yeah. being. Manifester, yeah. pure yang, right? What were you going to say, John? Oh. Well, we, we incubate our business, but the way we do it, like, I went to Techstars, which is a startup incubator, and most of the people there are generators, and they all came in saying, here's what our business is. And the first day they, you're there, they tell you you're in here in spite of your idea, not because of it. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to do is what's called customer development. <laughs> you're going to do 10 interviews per week with potential customers where you tell them nothing about your business. You simply write down what they say. And then out of that, if they don't mention the problem you're trying to solve, you need to change what your business is and try to think of a new value proposition because they don't care. So every generator comes in going, I'm going to solve the world's problems. I'm going to launch this business. And what, the, what Techstars was training us to do, not even knowing human design, was basically training us to be responsive and to respond to what comes along. Because mm -hmm. we might have thought our business is doing ABC, but it's really going to end up doing XYZ. Because our thoughts and our ideas of what we're going to do as generators are really our own worst enemy. Now, a manifester, it's different. They actually can do what we all wish we could, which is build the curriculum top down. It's like hierarchy. It's like, it's like for people who do development, uh, product development, product design, uh, the manifesto is very waterfall. It's not an iterative process. It's not like you do 800 iterations of something to figure it out. You do it once and it's perfect and that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's perfect and the reason it's done right is because they knew the right time to do it. They didn't do it last year. They didn't do it <laughs> next year. They knew how to launch it. They knew how to message it. They knew how to communicate it. They knew exactly who they needed and what leverage points and who was needed at what point. And they just pulled it off perfectly, and that's something we'll never be able to do. So what we have to do instead is so many generators are waiting to start their business because they have a fantasy of initiating. What we need to do is make incremental progress every single day by basically grinding on something that is satisfying to us. If it's like truly satisfying. Like if you're not satisfied making ads or putting out ads, don't make ads. Like if you're not satisfied, you know what I mean? Like. A manifester can make ads because they know exactly how to advertise. 
Yeah. So would it make sense though to have like a manifestor business partner? Absolutely. If you can get a manifestor to work with you, I mean a manifestor and like four generators is a classic. So now it's the projector and four generators, but it used to be manifestor and four generators. Um, there so are projectors a lot of, would be good too? Projectors are great. Yeah, projectors are wonderful at orchestrating and guiding the work of generators. That's kind of one of the things they're here to do. But you see a lot of classic uh, companies, Spotify I believe it is, has a manifestor, CEO, and then the rest of the C-suite are all generators. And it's like the CEO is in charge of saying what they're doing and everyone else makes it happen. Mm -hmm. And that is great because then the generator has a job to do and the job has clearly defined parameters and they're satisfied when they finish the job. And you know what I mean? It's kind of, it's like we're not here, generators aren't here to initiate, but we are here to work. And so if we're doing the right work, it'll be satisfying to us and we'll be satisfied every single day instead of waiting for in frustration for a future point when we'll no longer be frustrated because we will have launched the business. So that's what generators get stuck in. They get stuck in this fantasy that someday I won't be frustrated because I'll be a manifester and I'll be able to initiate and start it all. And it's like, then it'll all just flow. And instead it's like, like I've, I've struggled with this too because I've tried to launch various things like high desert human design. I have to ultimately continually remind myself on a daily basis that every step I make has to be for me, something that I enjoy, so that my enjoyment is put into it. So I can't think, am I going to get my money back on making these, you know, magazines? Cause we, we, we make a magazine every year. It's kind of a schedule, a guidebook. I just have to think, I love this guidebook. I want this guidebook for my own collection. I'm going to build it. I'm going to print up a hundred of them. If others want the guidebook, they can buy them for 40 bucks or, or whatever. But I'm basically building it for me first, building the thing that I would use, building the thing that I love. And then if other people, it's, it's very field of dreams. For manifestors, it's not field of dreams. For manifestors, it's, it's, there's a vision and the vision has to be realized. And the vision is, let's build the Pyramid of Giza. You know, and the Pyramid of Giza wouldn't be built. Yeah, that's where I'm, I'm having trouble at this point in my life as a manifester. It feels like all of the other types have the what built into the how. In the, sen in the sense of, like, it's something that exists out there in the world already, and you're responding to it or being invited to it or, or you know, going through your cycles. Uh, and, like, I just want to do so much. And now I'm, now I'm like, I'm like, I'm doing tattoos, tarot readings, trying to go to school to be a psychologist, uh, working at three different galleries, like, to, to just like running, running a rave and a, a yeah. event space. And, and I'm like, it's just like, so, and like, not, well, you need generators because the manifestor yeah. starts it and then hands it off and hand it off, start it and hand it off and keep making the money on it. But, see, but the funny thing is like most of these things that I want to do are very solo, very like individual tasks. And so it's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> that's okay. that's well, yeah. Like, and it's true that Rod, Rod did all of his own artwork and design and he also made music and put up CDs. I mean, as a manifestor, you can do a lot. It's not that you can't. I think it's just it's not the timing. Of make that. sure. Well, make sure. I mean, also you have an undefined ego, right? And an mm -hmm. undefined ego will often work for free. Yeah. And so that's part of the deconditioning I is. I know, I know, but, <laughs> but the I'm like, more no, you're right, able, oh, an invoice. <laughs> but the more you're able to sort of overcome your natural aversion to getting paid, the more you can. <laughs> sorry, but that's the you know the more the more resources you'll have to then be very selective with your use of energy and not have to do anything repetitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's one thing to say you're running an event space; it's another thing to like clean the event space. Like oh. you don't need to clean it; you can get mm -hmm. other you can get other people to do that. Good. Okay. Well, that's that's very get the important. Out. Yeah, you can make the checklist. Give them the checklist. I guess maybe that's in, but also what's interesting about some of these, a lot of these tasks that seem very, like individual, like taking place. Like I'm the one only doing it, but that they are. It's a it's a thing, but it's a different. Like giving a tattoo is a different thing every time. You know, with different people, you're you know doing the same thing, but it's like well, you have a creative manifestor channel as well. Twelve point two is one of the yeah. creative channels, right? so it's um. So I mean, part of it is you have this need to be creative, and yeah, I mean, it's not. I don't think. I mean, it's also just it's undefined sacral and knowing how much energy you have and when you're spread too thin, and then being able to let go of the things that that 
are less important for you or less impactful in the world. I mean, it's, yeah, it is kind of a question. I mean, the, every type is going to have its issues, and so the generator is going to have nearly endless energy to crank away on things the manifestors can be jealous of. They're actually jealous of us. It's funny that we're so jealous of them because we just want to launch our business. They're so jealous of us because they're like, you can just work day in, day out. Like, you can just, we can, we're the grinders, you know? We're just here to grind every day. But what's funny is so many generators aren't grinding. In fact, the moment that they start actually making progress towards their goal, or the moment that they start actually building something, they're so satisfied that they built it. But the planning is not building. You know, the planning for a future vision is kind of like, you know, when it's launched. Like, I've, I've come up with this. Like, I've come, I've come up against this because I have projects that I'm working on, and they are marathons, not sprints. I can't sprint my way to building something. I have to make incremental progress every day, and I have to build it in such a way that it's satisfying to me, like, oh, I built a login page, like, I, it's a website. Like, I can't just create the whole vision for the website. I have to actually enjoy building each little piece of it. We're the builders. Yeah. Kind of deep, but, like, something I'm working through in my own in my life is that my childhood was, in my opinion, pretty traumatic. And I think I dissociated from really being there and so part of that is like I feel like I don't even know what I really enjoy and so as a generator I want to be in joy and there are things that I feel that I know that I like but I also feel like there might be a bigger bridge there to really be in that joy so it's so true I speak to that it absolutely is I mean it's yeah when we're traumatized we kind of get cut off yeah like you said cut off from presence or we get cut off from the the joy and um generators are here to be satisfied and really every time you do something that you sacrally respond to it ultimately is satisfying even if it's something that doesn't seem it's, it seems insignificant from the mind trying to be the manifester like this is a big distraction i'm trying to get from point a to point z and now i have to you know i have to do all this other stuff in between and it seems like a big distraction but but ultimately, the real question is, are we going uh-huh or uh-uh to it? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we're going along trying to get to this one point we see, and the sidetrack comes along, but we actually respond to it, and we're surprised. We're surprised to respond to it because we think we need to be working on this or that. You know, We think that it's going to take us further away from our goal. But ultimately, it's really about... For the generator, if it's if you really want to do it, you know you'll know by trusting that sacral sound. Or if you're a manifesting generator, you'll know by just observing yourself. Like manifesting generators will sometimes notice that they're like getting packed, even though they didn't realize they're going on a trip. They're just like trying to get ready and make sure they have their passport. They're like, wait, do I want to go on a trip? I guess I do. Jeez, you know. But like they're responding to it. They're already. Someone just mentions, hey, there's a trip coming up. Will we do this? And they're like. I don't know, I'll get back to you. And then they're like, well, my passport's here, and I guess I have... Like, they're kind of, like, noticing themselves get everything ready. And then they're like, I guess I want to go, you know? They just noticed themselves do it. Um, so, I mean, that, that's really the experiment. The experiment for generators is getting to discover what you respond to. And if you're, if you're not a manifesting generator, then that means you probably make sounds, so and that can be even easier to tell. Because you'll probably make a uh, sound if you don't want to do it, or... Uh, mm -hmm. or whatever and you can do what are called sacral sessions where you have a friend ask you you know do you like chocolate uh-huh do you like broccoli uh-huh do you like asparagus uh-huh do you like this uh-huh do you like that uh-huh do you like this uh-huh you know and you can kind of go through and then start asking do you like where you live and you're like oh uh yes and it's like maybe you don't you know <laughs> or something right mm -hmm. but you can get to the harder questions once you've kind of primed primed the response it's like and muscle testing. Yeah. Yeah, muscle mm -hmm. testing and also I know a lot of people in human design also do muscle testing. So leaning forwards or back for like yes or no. Yeah, you can absolutely sound muscle test. Totally yeah, sounds, muscles, mm -hmm. leaning, any sorts of physical things. It's, it's just, it's just yeah. um, gauging the like a reflex response. Mm -hmm. and, and it could even be saying yes or no, but just with the saying it as quick as Sure. No, yeah, 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 probably. And especially for manifesting generators because they have a direct connection. I mean, similar to what Carl Jung did when he developed the um, he developed the association <laughs> test where he would just say, what do you think of when you hear this word? And then he would just say another word. And it's like, you know, mother, father, this, that, you know. Mm. And he didn't actually look for what word they said. He looked for when they paused. Mm. Because when somebody paused and couldn't say a word, that was a real tender trigger for them. 
there was something there he needed to work through. So it was less important what they said and more about they could naturally flow and then suddenly they get stuck on something and they would say a certain word they would suddenly tap into some trauma or some yeah. complex. Any comments on generators, Mike? Any advice you give generators in your readings or any... Uh, generators in general? Yeah. For generators trying to launch a business. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I want to hear what Mike has to say about it. Because we have to, we have to do things. We're here to build, I and mean, we can't just not use our energy. Like. And to say, my business already exists, and I am responding to my clients' evolution, so it's not right. And, 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 and it's, it's well, and also it's like even just how do you build a business? Is like when when the clients are knocking down your door, and you just can't keep up with them. Like you naturally, it takes it to the next level. It's just hard to like. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's all different stages of business. There's ideas for a business, or there's like real businesses that are already having clients, and there's a oh. the question of. <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of. Why do we use Olivia as an example? She's a generator who's building business. It's well, decentralized. Okay, well, the two things I'm working on, I was thinking, uh, well, one thing I'm writing a book. But I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't my idea to write the book because other people kept telling me that I should write the book and then eventually I felt like the book was already like writing itself. So I felt like I should write it down. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then I am enjoying it. Um, and then the other business is also out of like this like demand and kind of other people's ideas, tell, people telling me I should do this thing. Well, and I, I, I but, do it. but you it's also just like paint nonstop, right? And that's, I mean, that is a great example of a generator. If you build it, they will come. Like you paint, you're not marketing nonstop. You're not, you know, you're not I announcing the paintings. <laughs> yeah, you're just kind of <laughs> painting it, and then people, you're not going around saying, "Hey, I'm a painter. You should buy my piece." It's like they people just say, like, "Oh, you paint? Okay, I see your work. Oh, okay. you know." Uh, I mean, it's really about. It's about building, and if you're building something, then you're doing the right thing. The, the difficulty is when the generator is not building, like at Techstars, these people were not building, they were fundraising for their vision and their business plan, and that's a very initiating kind of thing to do. Because they're saying, we need $200,000, and then we need another million by this time, and that gives us this to this, and we're gonna hire these people, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna, you know, that is the role of the manifester. And it's not that they couldn't do it, it's that, because most of them were generators, and, and again, Techstars doesn't know human design, they just learned what works. 90% of Techstars businesses succeed, as defined by still being in business in the present day or having exited, having sold. And so it's basically inverse from around, you know, only 10% succeed otherwise of startups. And so 90% of Techstars businesses succeed, why? Because they have a tried and true methodology of customer development which is telling everyone you're in here in spite of your ideas, not because of them, and you're not going to work on your idea, your way to do customer development, which is you're going to interview people, you're going to observe, you're going to discover what it is you're making and what problems you're solving. Instead of saying, you know, but again, it's not the manifester way. Like, a manifester would probably be able, I mean, I bet manifestors made tech stars, you know what I mean? Like, they didn't do customer development for that. They just said, this is what we're going to do now. So manifestors can kind of go in with the plan and execute the plan and suffer the consequences. And usually it'll work, and sometimes it doesn't. But either way, they're not iterating day in, day out, day in. I mean, some of these companies were doing 90, 100 interviews. I mean, this is an iterative process of a drudge of every single day just grinding away in a sort of a brute force way. This is not the manifester way. But the generators who really responded to it and were into it were very successful doing that because they were building every day. They were building, they thought that they were building their dream, their vision, and then they went into this program and what they ended up building was expertise in what a particular customer segment is looking for. And by the end of it, they could tell you every last thing about these people because they've interviewed 90 of them. Uh, you know, but that's not the manifester way. The manifester way is I'm just going to make the plan and execute on the plan, and then if it works, it works. If it doesn't, I'll suffer the consequences. You know. Mike didn't get to respond. What is it? Mike didn't get to respond. Oh, okay. Yeah, do it. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Well, unexpectedly, yeah, that did kind of dovetail into what I've just been hung up on something that C said kind of at the beginning of what you were saying. You felt like manifestors were alone in terms of the what you said and the what, what, it, what like, they where wanted. Where does the what come from? Where does the what come from? 
So it just, I, yeah, I was like hanging out there for a second on that what. And I just kind of came to these axioms pretty um, intuitively, but it's just like the manifester looks at the world and despairs because what they want isn't there. They have to do it. Oh. The, the projector looks at the world and despairs because what they want is in the world, but it's not in the right place. <laughs> the reflector looks at the world and despairs because what they want is in the world, but no one notices. And they don't notice, and they don't know. There's no awareness. It's there, but it's hidden. Nobody knows. And the generator knows that everything is in the world. Everything is there. It's all there. And the generator may not know what they want, and they certainly don't know what the move is. But there's no faith about whether it's out there or not. I mean, there's no lack of faith about whether it's out there or they not. Know there's no question of faith about whether it's out there or not. Manifestor needs to know that, knows that they need to make it happen. Projector knows that it's there and just has to position it right. Reflector knows that it's there, but it's, there's a lack of faith about whether that does anyone any good, because who, who's there to identify it, you know? And that ties in really well with the manifester being here to impact, the impact creating something new, the projector being here to organize or orchestrate or position, as you're saying. Arrange, the, ref yeah. the reflector is all about awareness, because they basically are, I mean, that is the name of the game for the reflector, in a way. And then the generator is here to work, and... They're in it. They, they just, are it in a weird way. Yeah. Mm. But they they just, are what they want, unlike oh, the other times. <laughs> in a weird way. <laughs> but the generator often doesn't doesn't know. I mean, the generator can be wasting a lot of time in unfruitful ways because they're not actually building anything, because they're waiting to start building something when they can finally initiate once and for all. Mm. But they can't ever, <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like, after I initiate, I'll start building. And it's like, well, you're not going to initiate, so just build now. Build every day. Mm -hmm. Like, paint your painting. Like, don't wait until, you know, you, you initiate a painting studio. Like, mm -hmm. you just paint. The studio will form around the act of painting. Mm -hmm. like, start writing your book now. Don't worry about getting an agent and worry about all the things that have to happen. Because as you incrementally build, those micro-satisfactions continue the you know they, they propel you on and and otherwise the frustration leads to a sort of inertia where yeah where that's the gravity you're describing it just sort of coalesces around you and as you as you keep confirming it through the tiny stuff yeah all right should we call it yeah thank you. Thank, thank you thank you all thank you all for coming yeah thank you so much thank I appreciate you. it it was really good thank you yeah okay.